Have you ever heard of Frank Abagnale? This man pretended to be a lawyer, a doctor, an airplane pilot, and managed to work these professions without understanding a damn thing about them. They even made a movie about him with Leo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks. So today I want to tell you the story of a man compared to whom Abagnale is just a small-time crook. Jolo didn't change his profession, he took his scam to a much higher plane. He managed to pretend that he had unlimited power and money, that with one word he could open the doors to ministers and palaces of sheiks, and he could fake his position in such a way that people in the highest positions believed him and allowed Lo to gain access to billions of dollars on which he lived like a great Gatsby. His parties were packed with stars of the first magnitude like DiCaprio and Paris Hilton, parties that resembled those from the famous movie The Wolf of Wall Street, which, incidentally, was filmed by Joe Lowe's company. Today you will see the story of probably the most audacious scam of the 21st century. So if you're interested in hearing how the son of an ordinary Malaysian businessman managed to deceive the rulers of several countries and the largest banks on the planet, then meet Joe Lowe on the other side of the law. My audience loves hearing stories about old-time crimes, but there's no shortage of them happening right now. And even when you're surfing the web, you could become a victim of intruders, sometimes without even realizing it. Connected to an unknown Wi-Fi, clicked on a banner or some link by mistake, and now the criminals have your data. But this could be easily avoided because there is today's sponsor, NordVPN, that solves these problems. Unidentified Wi-Fi? You could connect it without fear because NordVPN encrypts your traffic and scammers won't get anything. You clicked on the link by accident? It's not scary. NordVPN has a threat protection function that will warn you if the link is dangerous. It also checks for viruses and all files you download. NordVPN also has a function, Dark Web Monitor, that will tell you if hackers have your password. To avoid such incidents, you can use NordPass Password Manager. It not only generates a strong password for you, but it also securely stores it. NordVPN does not collect or transmit data about your online activities. Big deal in today's world. And finally, NordVPN is officially the fastest VPN in the world. I don't see any good reasons for you not to hit up that link in the description and grab the exclusive deal from NordVPN. It's all about ensuring your online experience is both comfy and secure. In the link in the description, nordvpn.com slash on the other side of the law, we'll be waiting for your two-year plan plus four extra months. Jolo was born in 1981 in the city of Georgetown, which is located in the state of Penang, Malaysia. The Lo family had moved here from Thailand in the early 1960s. However, by nationality, Joe was an ethnic Chinese. His grandfather, named Meng Tak, had fled the Middle Kingdom in the 1940s when China fell under Japanese occupation. Meng Tak left his homeland with virtually no money, and by the time he moved to Malaysia, he was already one of the richest residents of Georgetown. Officially, he earned his wealth by investing in iron mines, but rumor has it that the funds were derived from opium smuggling. Joe's father, Larry Lowe, continued to increase the family's income. In the 1980s and 90s, he was involved in the garment industry in Malaysia, which was then growing at a furious pace. Besides his other responsibilities in the firm where Larry worked, he was also responsible for making deals when his company absorbed smaller ones. And to make more money on this, he came up with the following scheme. Larry would go to the owner of the company and negotiate with him on the price for which he would sell his company and then offer him 10 to 20% more if he was willing to give Larry a kickback. In other words, Larry would present his bosses with an inflated price and take the difference from the real price to be moved offshore. Eventually, his bosses caught him and forced him to leave the company and sell all the shares he owned. Larry made $15 million from the sale of the stock, which was a very good fortune for Georgetown, where most families lived on $1,000 a month. However, for his son, he wanted an even better fate and began to prepare him for this for childhood. First, Joe went to an international school in Georgetown and then went to the UK to the private school Harrow, where many prominent personalities had studied, from Cumberbatch to Byron to Rothschild to Churchill. Successful completion of studies at such institutions opened doors for young people to the very best universities around the world, and Larry hoped that it would help his son to have a great career in the future. On the whole, it did help, just not in the way Lowe Sr. had intended. Once in Harrow, Joe realized that his family fortune, big by Penang's standards, was actually very small in the scale of the world. Here he was surrounded by the children of sultans and sheiks, whose parents were not only richer, but also had a much higher position in society. On this soil, Joe began to show talents for social mimicry. Studying at Harrow, Lowe told everyone that he was actually a Malaysian prince, not the son of a successful swindler. 
And to reinforce his theory, he even asked his father to arrange with a billionaire acquaintance so that while he was away, Joe could invite his friends from school to relax on his yacht and in his mansion. In order to make everyone believe that this was his house, Lowe replaced all the photos of the owner's family with photos of his own family. Teenagers of 15 or 16 years of age had no reason to double-check whether he was a prince or not, and Lowe's fakery succeeded. Of course, the other Malaysians at school made fun of him, but Joe didn't care. He had achieved what he wanted. The children of the nobles and rulers saw him as one of their own. He continued in the same vein at the University of Pennsylvania, where he enrolled after graduating from Harrow. Here he drove around in expensive rental cars, threw parties worth tens of thousands of dollars, which took months to pay off, and spent almost all the money his father sent him in casinos. And all this in order to feel at home among the richest and most influential students. Surprisingly enough, it worked again. The rumors spread from Harrow that he was a Malaysian prince, and Lo, spending money left and right, only confirmed these speculations. And although no one could say exactly who he was, you'd be happy to know him because he had money and knew how to spend it cheerfully. And what else would the so-called golden youth want? Joe was living the life of a man he wanted to be. However, all these manipulations and attempts to pass himself off as someone he really was not at the time did not have any intention other than gain acceptance among the elite. But once in the party, Joe finally began to realize what prospects could open up for him thanks to such acquaintances. Lowe socialized mostly with people from the Middle East, the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, and so on. And the more he got close to them, the more he realized what kind of money they had. These countries were reborn when oil was found in their territories. Dollars flowed, and a small group of people controlled the flow in each country. And Joe's goal was to get as close to that group as possible. To do this, he asked to visit his friends and organized a kind of tour of the Middle East, where he tried to make as many contacts as possible. But since the children of the nobles, with whom Joe had communicated at Harrow, did not especially wish to maintain communication with him, and since there were no such people at the University of Pennsylvania, the acquaintances who agreed to accept him were mostly children of businessmen who had little or no contact with the ruling class. Because of this, he was unable to meet anyone with any connection to the ruling class in most countries, but he did get one hit. In the United Arab Emirates, he managed to meet Yusuf al Otaiba, the foreign policy advisor to the sheikhs of the country. Otaiba came from a very wealthy family, received a first class education in the United States, and by the time he was 30 years old, he had achieved significant success in his political career. However, his father had many children, which meant that Otaiba did not receive much money from him. For a long time, he had to focus on his political career, but when he reached a position close to the sheikhs, he realized how much better one could live with more money. And Lowe's meeting with Otaiba happened exactly when the latter was looking for opportunities to multiply his existing capital. Joe was lucky. When he turned on his social chameleon talents again, they worked. At the meeting, he remembered everything he had been taught at the university. Lowe had been an economics major, and he dumped it on Otaiba, emphasizing that deals between the Middle East and Asia were extremely promising and that Joe himself was connected in Malaysia and could help with those deals. Otaiba took the bait and introduced Lowe to several other influential people, chief among them Khaldun Khalif al-Mubarak, who ran the sovereign wealth fund Mubadala Development. Al-Mubarak managed tens of billions of dollars and was actually what Lowe was looking for. Joe told him everything Otaiba had told him. Al-Mubarak, however, who understood more about economics, was wary of the young Malaysian's suggestions and asked for more specific suggestions than descriptions of how to invest well in the growing Asian market. That was the jackpot. Lowe had succeeded in blowing dust in the eyes of a man who controlled billions. Now he needed to do the same thing back home, so he could arrange a deal between them. So he'd go directly from graduation to the world of big money. The project that would bring Joe into the big time was the Iskander Development Region, which was a giant construction project aimed at creating a financial center to rival Singapore. Lowe learned that Hazen Foundation, which was in charge of the project, was looking for partners willing to invest large sums of money. Joe immediately went to them and told them that he was the unofficial representative in Malaysia of the Mubadala Development Foundation, which was ready to invest its money. Hazen expressed interest, and Lowe went to the Emirates and introduced himself to Al Mubarak as an unofficial representative of the Hazan Foundation. In reality, as you already realize, Joe was nobody in these negotiations, but he played the role of an important person so skillfully that he was believed. With the same fake persona as the organizer of the Deal of the Year, he went to a politician named Najib Razak. Lowe realized that if he wanted to be successful in the world of big money, he would need political patronage. Razak was the perfect candidate for this. Lowe was well acquainted with Najib's stepson, Riza Aziz. 
They had lived in the same house and socialized for most of their lives, so it was easy for Joe to get an audience with Razak, who was being touted as Prime Minister. He came to Najib not so much with an offer as an offering. Lo, again projected the aura of an important person, told Razak that he had arranged a very big deal that could serve the people of Malaysia in the long run. However, he did not want glory, but he wanted Najib to take all the credit publicly, which would be good for his political image. In the end, things worked out just fine for Lo. Middle East partners were confident of his influence in Malaysia. Malaysian financiers believed he was well-connected in the Middle East, and the man who would very soon be the country's top politician was in his debt. The illusion that Lo had created had materialized. By pretending to be an important man, he had indeed convinced those around him. And now, all he had to do was figure out how to monetize his aura of power. As a result of the Iskandar deal, Mubadala Development Fund and tens of millions more from other Middle Eastern funds also interested in the project. All those contracts, both in the Middle East and in Malaysia, earned millions of dollars. Joe himself, since he was an unofficial person in this transaction, received no commission and was forced to look for other ways to earn money. To do this, he created a company in the Virgin Islands and gave shares in it to Ambassador Otaiba of the Emirates, as well as several aristocrats from Kuwait and Malaysia. Lo explained to them that he wanted to thank them for their help in the deal that would create a name for him and was willing to gift them a portion of his future earnings. Was this true? Of course it wasn't. As soon as these people accepted their shares, Joe immediately went to Malaysian banks to ask for loans, highlighting the prominent people who were shareholders in his venture. In this way, he managed to raise about $20 million, with which he bought several companies involved in the construction of the Iskandar project, as well as the land where this construction was to take place. He then created several offshore companies in the Seychelles called Adia Investment Corporation and Kia Investment Corporation. These names were chosen to create the illusion that they were linked to the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, or ADIA, and the Kuwait Investment Authority, or KIA, two sovereign wealth funds with multi-billion dollars of capital. Both companies had only one bearer share. That is, to find out the real owner of the firm, one had to find the person who physically held the certificate of that share. The two companies also bought small stakes in the construction firms Lowe had bought earlier, and thus Lowe created another illusion. In reality, he had simply racked up loans and bought a few construction firms. However, for everyone around him, it seemed that he, together with aristocrats from Kuwait and Malaysia, with the Emirati ambassador Otaiba, as well as with some of the world's largest wealth funds, was doing something extremely clever and potentially profitable because such people and structures could not be wrong. And all that was left now was to find an extremely rich, but not too smart person, to whom Lo could sell this illusion at an inflated price. And this man was the head of the Malaysian state of Sarawak. Taib bought Lowe's construction firms and land at five times what they had originally cost, paying the young Malaysian $110 million. Most would have stopped there, as the money was colossal. Why take the risk of committing new scams if it would be enough for the rest of your life? However, Lowe was not a typical person. Plus, he had already tasted blood and was ready to continue to make money out of thin air. And all more so since he already had a plan. But why be an intermediary between foundations, if you can organize your own, so to speak, with blackjack and whores? At first, he tried to do it through the sultan of the Malaysian state of Terengganu, Maizan Zainal, a Biden, whom he had reached through his sister, and with whom Lo had met during the Iskandar deal. However, the sultan changed his mind at the very last moment. Then Joe switched to Najib Razak, who had just become prime minister of Malaysia. During all that time before, Lo had tried in every possible way to grease his relationship to that family. He helped Razak's children with money, paid for their education, and so on. But most importantly, he gave gifts to Naseb's wife, Razma Mansour, who had great influence on the prime minister. And Razak was more cooperative than the sultan. Lo told him how he would attract billions of dollars from the Middle East, and how the money would then be invested in everything from green energy and tourism development in Malaysia itself to lucrative projects abroad, and how Kuala Lumpur would be transformed under Najib after that. But the main thing Joe promised Razak was that he would help finance his political life. He assured him that he could discreetly withdraw money from the fund and apply it to the activities necessary to maintain Najib's power. So under Razak's patronage, the new sovereign wealth fund was created in Malaysia to be called One Malaysia Development Berhad, or 1MDB. The management was taken over, of course, by Joe Lo. The first big deal Lowe would make on behalf of the fund was a joint venture with Saudi oil company Petro Saudi, and the story of how he got into it deserves some detail. As soon as Joe received $110 million from the sale of the construction companies, he began to hang out in the States and to facilitate his life in this manner, used the services of a man named Sali Jabreasis, 
Sali was in the business of arranging vacations for rich people. He did everything for them, from booking a table in a restaurant to arranging a private jet full of models. Lo wormed his way into Sali's confidence and began asking about his clients, learning in one conversation that one of them was Prince Turki bin Abdullah al Saud of Saudi Arabia. Prince Turki was one of more than 20 children of the ruler of Saudi Arabia. Neither in politics nor in business, he had been distinguished by special successes, and his main brainchild was a small oil company, Petro Saudi, which was managed by Tariq Obaid. Through Sali, Joe found an opportunity to contact the prince and begin implementing his scheme. He told the prince that he represented the 1MDB fund and had influence over Malaysian politics, offering him a meeting with Prime Minister Razak to discuss the possibility of a joint project. And he, in turn, told Najib that he had close contacts with the ruling Saudi dynasty who were willing to consider a business proposal and, if it suited them, put their money there. Eventually, Razak and Prince Turkey did meet, agreeing on a joint project. Petro Saudi would put up its oil assets, $2.5 billion worth of development rights in Turkmenistan and Argentina, and 1MDB would invest $1 billion to carry out this development. The organization of the details of this deal would be worked out by Tarek Obeid and Joe Lowe, who very quickly found a common language and a common vision of how the development of the oil fields would be carried out. In brief, they decided that it was not necessary and $300 million would be enough to stimulate the activity. The remaining $700 million could be spent in much more fun ways. Now, I could spend five minutes telling you exactly how they did it, bogging you down with boring economic detail. However, I'll spare you all of that. All you need to know is that they set up a company in the Seychelles called Good Star Limited with one bearer share. They then convinced the banks that they were arranging joint accounts for Petro Saudi and 1MDB that $300 million should be put into these joint accounts, that $300 million should be put into these joint accounts and $700 million should go to Good Star Limited, supposedly to repay Petro Saudi's loan. Of course, there was no loan and the money simply went to the company controlled by Lowe. Joe gave about $250 million from it to Obeid, who gave most of it to Prince Turkey. And what Lowe got, he spent on his luxurious life, the luxurious life of Prime Minister Razak's family and his political needs. However, he spent so profligately, as we discuss in this other chapter, that a year later the fund needed a new injection. This time the Prime Minister allocated $800 million from the Malaysian budget, most of which were also withdrawn in various ways to Lowe's accounts. Obviously, this did not help either. The fund was unprofitable by all indicators, which was not surprising. However, all those aside knew about it. On the outside and most importantly on paper, 1MDB remained a successful enterprise almost until its closure. Lowe managed to create illusions here too. Revaluations of petrosoil oil fields by loyal experts, accounting reports from firms willing to turn a blind eye to many things, as well as various economic twists allowed Lowe to make it seem that the fund remained profitable in the reports. I won't tell you all the tricks that Lowe used, but I'll give you one example so you understand what I'm talking about. The $1.8 billion, which were invested in a joint project with Petro Saudi, but never reached it, had to be covered somehow so that no one would raise a question about where the money had gone. Naturally, there was nowhere to get it, so Lowe and his accountant came up with a scheme. They took a billion dollars worth of Petro Saudi's drilling rigs. Then they sold them for $2.3 billion to a fund in the Cayman Islands that paid not in money but in equity of their fund. Of course, the shares were not backed by anything, but on paper, 1MDB showed a profit of $500 million, which the compliant accountants were happy to approve. However, in reality, as you have already realized, no money was actually collected, and meanwhile, not only was the fund running out of money, but so was Lowe himself. So Joe upped the ante and came up with a new scheme. He devised a plan where 1MDB would buy up many firms that owned power plants, merge them into one firm, and then go public. In theory, the IPO of such a company could earn twice the initial investment. In practice, everything again came down to plain plundering. Under the guise of collecting funds to buy power plants, Lowe was going to issue 10-year bonds worth $1.95 billion. And in order not to wait for all the bonds to be sold and to get the money immediately, he sought the services of Goldman Sachs Bank. Joe gave the bank the bonds to be sold and immediately received $1.75 billion. The bank would sell the bonds and make $200 million. Everyone except the bondholders would get a windfall. From the money received, Lowe immediately embezzled $600 million and with the rest began to buy power plants at inflated prices, receiving kickbacks from their owners. When the money ran out, he once again conducted a bond issue for the same amount and again sold them to Goldman Sachs. All in all, he managed to get $1.5 billion out of this scam. 
And during all the time that he managed to fund, Lowe managed to steal more than $4.5 billion, most of which was obtained thanks to Goldman Sachs, who were happy to sell the bonds of the fund, turning a blind eye to its incomprehensible transfers to offshore zones. Which is not surprising. After all, the earnings here were 100 to 200 times higher than their normal commissions when performing and advising on such processes. Joe first brainwashed everyone with his alleged influence, and then he piled tons of money on people so they did not ask unnecessary questions about his business. And yet Lowe was sure that his scheme could not collapse, because Prime Minister Najib Razak, who regularly received donations from Joe, could always help the foundation with taxpayers' money. And these huge sums of money, as well as his sense of impunity, just blew the mind of a guy who had barely turned 30, making his life like one continuous party of the Great Gatsby. What would you do in your 20s and 30s if you had billions of stolen dollars in your hands? Start investing? Go into philanthropy? Or maybe try to create something of value for humanity? Probably not. That's how Jolo thought about it. He started having fun. And since there are limits to what you can do in Malaysia, Joe did it in the States. At first, it was like a typical rich kid's vacation. Fly to Vegas, play a couple tens of thousands of dollars in the casino, from there move somewhere to a club, find some beautiful girls, and go to a luxury hotel room to continue the fun until morning. However, very soon he got bored with such a cult program, and Lo, through people like Sally Jabriasis, whom we talked about earlier, started inviting various celebrities to his parties. In case you didn't know, it's common in the States for celebrities to make money by attending someone's event for a fee. Not in the sense of hosting it, but in the sense of just coming to hang out. And since Lowe had been used to earning favor since high school by spending money targeting the groups of people he wanted to infiltrate, he did not change his ways here. He wanted to win the friendship and love of Hollywood stars, so that they would be willing to come to his parties for more than just a fee. Lowe raised the bar of his parties to a cosmic level. The stars themselves, reporters, escorts, attendants, everyone who has ever been to one of his events, in one voice said that they had never seen such a scale. Just listen to how one of Joe's birthday parties was organized. People started gathering close to midnight in the presidential suite of the Palazzo Hotel at a cost of $25,000 a night. Swiss Beats and Leonardo DiCaprio, the stars who got closest to Jolo, could be seen there. Everyone gathered there, then made their way downstairs and got into a limo, heading to where the main party was to be held. Joe had built a huge room outside of town that looked like an airplane hangar. At the entrance to it, there was a checkpoint with armed guards to keep out outsiders, and near the entrance, there was a red carpet. Once inside, you would have thought you were at a festival rather than someone's birthday party. One side looked like a nightclub. There was a dance floor, lights, a DJ, and a bar. The other side was more like a theater or concert hall. Here, the Cirque du Soleil Circus performed their acts, and 20 dwarfs dressed in Oompa Loompa costumes acted as gestures, amusing the guests, among whom were even more stars. Benicio Del Toro, Kanye West, Kim Kardashian, Paris Hilton, Bradley Cooper, Zach Galifianakis, Martin Scorsese, Robert De Niro, and Tobey Maguire. Those are just a few of the names of those who were there. Once everyone was gathered, the big-name performers began to take the stage one by one. There was Psy, who had just blown up the world with his hit Gangnam Style. There was LMFAO, Busta Rhymes, Q-Tip, Pharrell Williams, Ludacris, Chris Brown. And at the end of the concert program, Britney Spears jumped out of a huge cake on stage. The whole party cost Lowe several tens of millions of dollars. And if you think that, well, it's a birthday, a special occasion, he could not constantly party like that. I'll tell you, he could. For example, in St. Tropez, in a mock competition bottle parade, which is organized in local clubs, he spent 2 million euro. The competition was to buy more champagne than your opponent. Lowe bought so much Cristal champagne that the whole club couldn't drink it overnight. On another example, on New Year's Eve, he again gathered some familiar stars for a party. In particular, there were DiCaprio and Jamie Foxx, who told the story. It was decided to begin the celebration in the afternoon, and someone in attendance joked that they were celebrating with Australia. Lowe thought it was funny, so he hired a private plane, loaded it with all of the guests, took them to Australia, where they celebrated the New Year, and then flew back to Vegas, where they celebrated it again. But it wasn't just the partying that Joe entertained himself. He bought a stake in the music company EMI, where such artists as Kanye West, Beyonce, Usher, Alicia Keys, and Pharrell Williams released their works. And he also founded his movie company, Red Granite Pictures, which had managed to release such films as The Wolf of Wall Street and Dumb and Dumber 2. Well, the fact that he had apartments and houses all over the world and could afford to drive any car is not even worth discussing. If a man could blow $20 million on his birthday, then he could easily find a house for such an amount. Naturally, with such money, he also had no problems with women. The most famous ladies with whom he was associated by the press were Paris Hilton and Miranda Kerr. However, things could not go on like this forever. 
the longer the foundation operated, the more people somehow found out or began to guess that Lowe was stealing money, and the playboy behavior that he displayed around the world didn't add to his credibility. And gradually, the source of Joe's money was actually starting to make its way into the public eye, which could only mean a quick end to his machinations. From the past chapters, you might have gotten the impression that Joe was some kind of shallow con man who hoarded a lot of money and just started burning through it. This is only partially true. The other side of the coin is that he had to constantly silence the objections within the fund itself. For this reason, 1MDB had a lot of turnover at all levels of management. Somehow he had to justify the wealth that had fallen to him. For this purpose, he created an intricate network of financial transactions, at the end of which money would come to him from his father's account, as if Joe had gotten rich from inheritance. And also he had to try to hide his wealth, which after all these parties and entertainments still totaled a huge sum. The first approach was simply to hide it in all kinds of offshore and semi-offshore zones, starting from Switzerland and Singapore and ending with the Seychelles and Cayman Islands. The second approach was to put it into real estate and businesses. Here we can include organizing a film company and buying a share in a music company, as well as buying houses, apartments, and hotels around the world. As an example, the La Hermitage Hotel in Los Angeles belonged to Joe for some time. Well, and the third way was to purchase artwork. In the vast majority of cases, they were paintings. So Lowe hid about $350 million in art objects and stored them in the Free Port of Geneva. A free port, in case you didn't know, is a special economic zone, most often physically represented in the form of warehouses, which is exempt from taxation. Rich people often hide their paintings and jewelry in such places in order to avoid paying taxes on them. And it must be said that such diversification turned out to be a very profitable solution, but more on that later. Now I'm going to talk about another investment, if it can be called that. Of course I mean Lowe's investment in Prime Minister Najib. I said before that he provided for the Razak family. He bought their children cars and houses, paid for their education, and later their own businesses. He did the same for Najib's wife, Rasma Mansour. Just one of the jewelry pieces Joe bought for her cost several tens of millions of dollars. The Prime Minister himself demanded spending in the political realm. As an example, he was not popular in one of the states of Malaysia, and to fix this, money from the 1MDB fund poured in on behalf of Razak, which went to build free housing, beautification of cities, paving of roads, and so on. If that were not effective enough, then at a time closer to the elections, the flow of money would be redirected towards bribing opposition politicians. And even if this was not enough, the money was spent on rigging the election results. This is how Jolo bought himself immunity in Malaysia. However, as it turned out, it was not enough, because his main problems would come from outside Malaysia. It all started with a guy named Xavier Justo, who worked as the head of Petro Saudi's London office. He was in charge of that big deal we mentioned above where Lowe turned $1 billion into $2.3 billion. Naturally, Justo's boss was involved and he found out about it. However, Xavier decided not to blow the whistle and continued in his position for a couple more years. As insurance, however, he copied all of the information from the company's servers. He ended up with 140 gigabytes of information consisting of 448,000 emails, documents, and other official papers, among which was evidence of the Jolo scam. When Justo quit his job, he was not paid 2.5 million Swiss francs of the promised 4 million in severance pay. Javier then started blackmailing Petro Saudi with information he had managed to copy. However, Petro Saudi, represented by one of its directors named Patrick Mahoney, blew Justo off. Lowe, on the other hand, knew nothing about the situation. Xavier was a bit saddened by the failed blackmail and started looking for someone who would be willing to buy this information for $2.5 million. This is how his path crossed with that of journalist Claire Rucastle Brown, who managed to find a sponsor to buy this data in the person of the owner of the Malaysian opposition newspaper, The Edge, Tong Kui Ong. And on February 28, 2015, an article titled Robbery of the Century was published, which told in full color how Joe had stolen money on the Petro Saudi deal. It was the beginning of his end. Razak immediately ordered Lowe to leave the country and hide somewhere. Najib himself almost lost power after the publication. The opposition held mass protest rallies, but Razak managed to suppress them and retain his prime minister's chair. However, it was Joe who received the most attention. After Claire Rucastle Brown's article, journalists from the Wall Street Journal became interested in the story, and very soon they managed to find a source inside the foundation. For many months, they studied the documents he provided them. They tried to figure out how Lowe was withdrawing and hiding the money. And then they published the results of their detailed investigation that left Joe with no chance of rehabilitation. His accounts in America, Singapore, and Switzerland were seized. One after another, stars renounced their friendship with him, and Lowe himself was prosecuted in several countries around the world. However, he has not yet been brought to justice, but his comrades in the scam were. Prince Turkey and Tarek Obeid were charged with corruption in Saudi Arabia. 
and Najib Razak, who lost the 2018 election, was also charged in Malaysia. For the most part, however, Malaysia's taxpayers are paying for this multi-billion dollar scam, as all debts will have to be paid by the state. As for Jolo, he has not yet been apprehended. He is said to be in hiding, either in China or Thailand. He's supposed to have at least 200 to 300 million dollars left. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if we never hear about his arrest, because with that kind of money, you could hide until you die. That was the story of Jolo, a story that exposes many of the ills of consumer society, where people are willing to see only what makes them rich and turn a blind eye to what is behind those riches.